Happy Mother's Day to you. And also want to give a special acknowledgement to those who, Mother's Day is tough. Mother's Day can be tough for a lot of reasons. It could be because your children are wayward and away from God right now. You're longing for them to come home. Uh, It can be because you're longing to be a mother, but just for various reasons, it's not possible at the moment. God sees you and he loves you and you get a happy Mother's Day as well. But I wanna speak to you this morning a word I'm, I'm very excited about. I've never preached Mother's Day before. And I, I like themes, and I like when Jesus gives me one. So it is a Mother's Day message, believe it or not. So I want you to go with me to 2 Kings chapter 4. I'm going to talk to you about the God who listens. The God who listens. 2 Kings chapter 4, and just hold it open. We'll be starting at verse 18. We're going to talk about the God who listens. 2 Kings chapter 4. Now, I'm excited because next month, Christina and I hit 12 years of marriage number of tribes of Israel, number of disciples. There's no significance to that. It's just, it's 12, you know, what are you going to do? But throughout our marriage, all 12 years of it, and even a little bit before, she's had to educate me on the art of listening. Okay, all the men said amen. But let's be clear on something. It's a certain kind of listening that she's after. Okay, there's a specific kind of listening that women in general want. Uh, And it's lent itself to this popular but false notion that men are poor listeners. It's not true. Amen. The truth is, we're just not the kind of listeners that women generally want us to be. Okay? The truth is, we're on the whole very adept listeners. In fact, we're so good at listening that if you tell us enough, we'll tell you how to fix your problem. But that's not the kind of listening that women want. That's the kind of listening that can get a man killed. Women don't want the kind of listening that leads to a proposed solution. Why? Because for women, a lot of the time, listening is the solution. Feeling heard is very nearly the same thing as feeling safe. Feeling heard is very nearly the same thing as feeling safe. Why? Because when a wife, when a mother, a daughter, a sister knows that she can pour out her heart, however muddled, however unclear, however hyper-detailed, when she knows she can do that without being minimized, without being dismissed, judged, or critiqued, very often that's all her heart needs to stay strong. Very often that's all that she needs And the passage that we're about to read is a story where listening was actually the first step toward a miracle. At the center of this passage is a woman from a town called Shunem. She is a very faithful Israelite. She expresses her loyalty to God by caring for Elisha the prophet. She realizes who she is and says, hey, let's build an upper room in our house for this guy so whenever he comes through, he can stay with us, he can rest and be refreshed. And Elisha, the prophet, is so moved by her care that he wants to bless her. He says, hey, can we speak to the king for you? Can we speak to the commander of the army for you? Basically offering her prestige, protection, and safety. And she's content to live among her people. She doesn't want anything from the prophet. She desires no special status. She's just a faithful, humble woman of God. But Elisha finds out that she is either barren or her husband is too old to give her a child. It's a bit unclear in the story. But in any case, he finds out there's this void in her life. She wants to be a mom. And for various reasons, it's not humanly possible. So Elisha calls her in and says, hey, this time next year, you're gonna be embracing a son. And the promise is too wonderful for her to believe. She objects, she says, don't lie to me, don't toy with me like that, Uh, you can't tell me things. And sure enough though, we find out in verse 17 that the word of the prophet came true and she held a little boy in her arms that following year. And this is where we are picking up in chapter four, Verse 18, it says, when the child had grown, this miracle baby that was given to the Shunammite woman, when the child had grown, he went out one day to his father among the reapers. And he said to his father, oh, my head, my head. The father said to his servant, carry him to his mother. And when he had lifted him and brought him to his mother, the child sat on her lap till noon, and then he died. And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door behind him and went out. Then she called to her husband and said, 
Send me one of the servants and one of the donkeys that I may quickly go to the man of God and come back again. And he said, why will you go to him today? It is neither new moon nor Sabbath. That was the wrong answer, if you're wondering. She said, all is well. Then she saddled the donkey and she said to her servant, urge the animal on, do not slacken the pace for me unless I tell you. So she set out and came to the man of God at Mount Carmel. When the man of God saw her coming, he said to Gehazi, his servant, look, there is the Shunammite. Run at once to meet her and say to her, is all well with you? Is all well with your husband? Is all well with the child? And she answered, all is well. And when she came to the mountain to the man of God, she caught hold of his feet and Gehazi came to push her away. But the man of God said, leave her alone for she is in bitter distress and the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me. Then she said, did I ask my Lord for a son? Did I not say, do not deceive me? He said to Gehazi, tie up your garment and take my staff in your hand and go. If you meet anyone, do not greet him. And if anyone greets you, do not reply. Lay my staff on the face of the child. Then the mother of the child said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So he arose and followed her. So we pick up at a part in the story where joy is being exchanged for grief. This boy mysteriously dies. We don't know why, if it was some kind of brain hemorrhage. Some have suggested a strange case of sunstroke. In any case, he died out of nowhere. They never saw this coming. And so she takes him up to Elisha's room and she lays him on his bed, shuts the door and sets out to find him. And she's so determined that she will allow nothing to keep her from reaching the prophet. And without asking about their child, her husband just dismisses what she's doing as insensible. She says, please send me a donkey and a servant so I can go to the prophet. He says, why? It's like, how about, how's the kid? Why wasn't that question asked? Kind of gives you a picture of what the dynamic might have been like within the home. So without even asking about the welfare of their child, he just dismisses her as insensible. And it's funny because in Hebrew, it, it, she simply says, shalom. It's almost like, peace, shut up. It's fine. It's the wrong answer, pal. Give me the donkey. So she silences her husband and she tells the servant to take her the 10 mile journey to Carmel without slowing down. This is a woman on a mission and she has good reason to be. We come to verse 25. Elisha sees her coming and he's eager to know if everything well, is well with his friend and with her family. So he sends Gehazi, ask her about everything. Is she okay? Is her husband okay? Is her husband all right? And she tells Gehazi, all is well. Same thing she says to her husband, shalom, everything is peace. She will not talk to anyone but the man of God. She will not disclose her heart to anyone but Elisha. And so she finally gets there. She does something that's wildly inappropriate by throwing herself at his feet and grasping hold of them. You, you do not, as an Israelite woman, lay hold of a prophet like that. He's a holy man of God. He's not for touching. You don't treat him that way. And so Gehazi is doing what he thinks is right, but Elisha is even more inappropriate. He stops him. He says, leave her alone. Don't touch her. Don't drive her away from me. Don't dismiss what she's doing right now. And Elisha is stunned by the situation. Look at what he says in verse 27. Let's read it again. When she came to the mountain to the man of God, she caught hold of his feet. Gehazi came to push her away, but the man of God said, leave her alone for she is in bitter distress and the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me. Now we as the readers are meant to be equally stunned by this. He's drawing attention to this for a reason. This is probably the most important part of the passage for us today, that God deliberately concealed her pain from Elisha. He deliberately kept Elisha in the dark and did not say anything to prepare him. God is silent in the passage. And prophets were very often, not always, but very often given special insight about such things. You can read all kinds of stories in the Old Testament where a prophet was forewarned, so-and-so is coming to kill you. So-and-so is coming to trap you. So-and-so is coming to seek a word from God. Tell them this. When you read the story of Saul meeting Samuel for the first time, Samuel has his whole week mapped out by the time they encounter each other. It's pretty wild. But here, Elisha is given no insight, no illumination, 
And the grammar that he uses, the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me. In, in Hebrew, this has to do with causation. God has caused it to be hidden. He's making God directly responsible for the fact that he doesn't know what's wrong with her. God has deliberately acted to hide and conceal this woman's pain. And so the question becomes, why would God conceal the pain of a woman who's been such an example of faith and godliness? Isn't he pleased with her? Doesn't he love her? And there's overwhelming emphasis on, she, on her refusal to speak to anyone but Elisha. That makes it even more strange that God doesn't tell, her, uh, tell him rather that she's coming. All she wants is to speak to the prophet and God won't speak to him. He says nothing. And so Elisha's reaction is very interesting because he understood something. He knew that a case like this doesn't require a prophet. It requires a pastor. She didn't need a prophet. She didn't need the thunderous man of God calling down fire from heaven and bears out of the woods. She needed a pastor. In other words, she needed someone to listen. She needed someone to hear what was going on because God was not silent because he refused to do anything. God was silent because he was listening. God heard her and he wanted his prophet to do the same. Let's think about the situation that this woman lived in. She lived all of her married life with the agony of an empty womb. She lived all of her married life under the agony of an unsupportive husband, both spiritually and parentally. She says, I need to go see the prophet. Why? It's not the new moon. It's not the Sabbath. You have no reason to go see him. What do you want to waste energy from the donkey? 10 mile trip there, 10 mile trip back. What's the point of that? And he was also no support parentally as far as we can tell. He knows his son is in such dire condition. He needs to be carried off to his mother. Never asks how he's doing. She's very alone. She's very alone in every respect. And then on top of that, she has to overcome multiple forces that want to keep her from getting to the prophet of God, that want to keep her from hearing from God. It began at home with her husband. Then Gehazi doesn't even want her near him. She's tenacious, but she's alone. God's not silent because he doesn't care. He's silent because he's listening. God's response was to put his prophet in the dark so the heart of this mother could be heard. Because God listens to the cries that no one else can and sometimes the cries that no one else will. And he makes them heard. And you look at what she does in verse 28. Then she said, did I ask my Lord for a son? Did I not say, do not deceive me? She doesn't say, please help, my son is dead. She accuses him. This is a, a scene of really raw emotion. It's coming out. It's, it's not just the grief and the anguish of the loss. It's the anger over, didn't I say, don't toy with me? Why did you have to do this to me? Why give just so it could be taken away? All of the anguish is coming out. It's coming out ugly. And isn't it amazing that Elisha's response is not to say, how dare you be so ungrateful to the blessing of God? Have you no faith? He meets her with grace. He listens. He listens to the ugly accusations. He listens to the angry words. He doesn't shut her down. He doesn't dismiss her. He doesn't write her off. He listens. And he tells his servant, take my staff in your hand, run as fast as you can and go and revive the boy. Now that's not exactly what happens. The miracle's coming, but we're seeing how the first step toward that miracle was listening. Her accusations and painful questions were not shut down. They were embraced. And you kind of see just a, a glimpse of what the New Testament talks about us having in Jesus because he died so that our sin and our pain could be met with grace at the throne of God. Hebrews 4.16 tells us that we can approach the throne of grace boldly and find grace to help in our time of need. What are the mothers in our lives met with when they pour out their hearts to us? You know, gentlemen, are we good at listening? Do we tend to be dismissive? Do we tend to minimize? Do we tend to get so rational and practical that we don't just hear what's coming out and listen for what might be going on under the surface? What kind of listeners are we in general? 
across the room? Do we really give attention to people when they're coming and pouring out all of the confusion and anguish that's going on inside of their heart? Elisha responded to those painful words. He's the one getting accused. He doesn't take it personally. He doesn't get offended. He doesn't get defensive. He responds by healing her son. Because you see, you cannot speak what God is speaking if you're not willing to listen the way that he listens. You cannot speak healing if you refuse to listen to heartache. You cannot speak life if you shut down and minimize the death that plagues people. You cannot speak what God is speaking. You cannot represent him in difficult situations if you won't listen the way that he's willing to listen. We want to be the prophet who's always got the solution beforehand. We don't often want to be the pastor that just shuts their mouth and listens and just lets all the ugliness come out, whether it makes sense or not, whether we get it or not, whether it's right or not. Sometimes you need to just listen. In a sense, there was nothing true about what the woman said in verse 28. She shouldn't have accused God. She shouldn't have accused Elisha. But was it really ingratitude that was animating her words? How often do we say things that are motivated by something other than what it sounds like? She sounds ungrateful, but that's not what the problem is. She sounds doubtful, but that's not what the problem is. Pain will very often distort our true intentions. It will distort what things are truly coming out of. When a person's hurting enough, they can sound angrier than they actually are. They can sound more biting than they truly are. They can sound more, they can sound more doubtful than they actually are. But we learn something from Elisha here. He wasn't given a word. He was simply given the sound of a broken heart. And God was simply telling him, listen to this and you'll know what to do. Just listen. I'm concealing it. I'm not telling you what's going on here. And so again, how well do we listen? How well do we listen to the sound of broken hearts in our lives, whether it's coming from our mothers, from our wives, from our daughters, from our sisters, or whether it's coming from a coworker, whether it's coming from another brother or sister in Christ? How well do we listen? Do we minimize our wives' emotions when they pour out our hearts, their hearts rather? And I can't tell you how bad I've been at this. I have been glaringly bad at this at different times. And I, like I said, at the beginning, I've been educated on the art of listening over the past 12 years. But, you know, and I just have to say this because it's something that I have been remarkably stunned and grieved by as I've come across it. Just not only how common it is for Christian husbands to minimize what their wives are trying to tell them, but I am amazed in the most negative way possible at the number of Christian men who are capable of calling their wives stupid. And if you're hearing my voice today and, and that's you and you're capable of that, whether you're in the room or online, you are atrociously far from the heart of Christ. There is no nice way to say it. You should not be capable of speaking that way to your life partner. You should not be capable of saying such things to the woman that God has given you. You know, you read what the husband in the story did. You know, his wife says, I need a donkey and a servant to go to the prophet of God. Well, why? That's stupid. Why would you go? There's no festival going on right now. Why would you go see the prophet? Doesn't even ask about the child. Well, what's wrong? Sweetheart, what's going on? Is everything okay? Why do you, why do you feel the need to go see the prophet? Asking why is very different from being dismissive. He doesn't care why. He's not interested in that. He's giving her reasons not to go. And if that's the reaction that we have, then we have some repenting to do. Are we quick to dismiss plans and actions if we don't see sense in them? How attentive are we in listening for what might be under the surface? And so some of us today, our response to the word of the Lord this morning has to be one of repentance, it needs to be asking the Holy Spirit for the power to shift and change in our thinking. But maybe some of us this morning are the Shunammite. Maybe you are just like her. And it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman in the room. You might be in that place of pain. You're just the sound of a broken heart that needs to be heard. Mother or not, 
married or not, woman or not, God is listening to your heart. He always listens. And just like we saw in verse 28, God doesn't despise the hard questions. He doesn't despise the the accusations that come out of us sometimes because we just don't know what else to do with what we're feeling. We don't know how to process some of the things that we're going through. You're allowed to get that out with him. You're allowed to pour out your heart before the Lord. The the Psalms speak that line probably at, at least three times, if my memory is correct, at least three times you can count the Psalms where it says, pour out your heart before him, O people. God doesn't despise those hard questions. Being listened to is just one step toward the miracle. But there's a flip side to that. If being listened to is the first part of getting to a miracle, then letting it out has to be part of that step. If you just internalize everything, and maybe some of you have conditioned yourselves to do that because letting it out isn't safe. Letting it out doesn't really serve a positive purpose. You've kind of trained yourself to not say anything. You've trained yourself to just internalize and hide it. That's not a healthy way to live. It's not the way your God wants you to live. You can't read this story and believe that God expects you to always put on a brave, stoic face. You're allowed to come apart with him. You're allowed to not know why you're coming apart. You're just allowed to do it. And if we're going to be the body of Christ to each other in a general sense, if we're going to be households of faith that reflect the beauty of Christ's love for his church, then that's the kind of listener that we need to endeavor to be. Be like the Shunammite. Refuse to accept death in your life. Refuse to accept death in your home. Be like the Shunammite. Shut down contrary voices that would try to kill your faith and tell you there's no sense in seeking God for a word. There's no sense in going to the prophet. There's no sense in bringing your need before the Lord. Shut down those voices. Be like the Shunammite. Let nothing keep you from getting to the God who always listens. The God whose ear is always open to your cry. Don't let any Gehazi push you away from his presence, whether that's your own guilt, your own shame, whether that's a sense of a lack of safety in your own life or in your home or relationships. Be like the Shunammite. Get to the prophet. Get to Jesus, the ultimate prophet, the ultimate Elisha who always hears And he always knows what to do. Our God always listens, amen? And he's listening to you.